Cal Molone from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And on the 11th of November, I bring you the 17th episode of The Resistance. And of course, it's not your typical Monday. It's also a federal holiday that we're appropriating and rebranding that culture of statism as the non-aggression day, which for the most part is an acknowledgement of the principle that you and I already follow, you know, the non-aggression principle, which universalizes the notion that the initiation of force is immoral. Um, you know, so much we come to find that most of our daily activities and interactions are voluntary. Um, you know, as we both experience in our day-to-day -day lives, that there's no need to initiate the use of force. There's no need to initiate the use of violence to solve our problems. And once you universalize this principle and extend it to everyone, you know, regardless of the title someone may hold or the color costume someone may wear, um, it becomes apparent then what the root of the problem in our society is. You know, if the initiation of use of force is immoral for us, it has to logically also be immoral for those who claim to call themselves the government. You know, which is nothing more than a group of people. You know, what's true for you and me is also true for an aggregate of individuals. And, you know, this is so much the fact that we can have a voluntary society. Uh, you know, we've seen many examples throughout history where people have the freedom to, to associate uh, where there's less violence, there's a lot more abundance, there's a lot more areas where humanity thrives. Um, you know, one just obvious example, you know, when people are prevented from freely producing, from selling, from buying food, you know, especially in oppressive countries, um, what we see then is a, what we see is famine, what we see is starvation, what we see is shortages. Uh, in contrast, when people are free to produce, to sell, to buy food, what we see is abundance, <laughs> what we see is diversity, what we see is predictability, um, etc. And you know, that's what comes with the non-aggression principle, that comes with the voluntary exchanges, that comes with the notion that we can find rich different ways to express ourselves and meet our needs and have those preferences um, fulfilled in a voluntary associative way that for the most part we already, we already find ourselves resolved to use in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, again, violence is very costly. You know, aside from the, I guess it's mostly a utilitarian argument, but aside from that, it's um, something that you kind of have to follow through with that more integrity, uh, and not just with the belief, but with follow through with the actions of your own life. You know, and as so much you universalize any other theory of um, gravity or thermodynamics or laws of nature. You know, there's no exceptions for that. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you for <laughs> joining me in for the non-aggression day and I'm going to begin with your news from underground. Palatin man warns of elaborate IRS scam. This is actually kind of funny. Palatin is nearby here in Richmond. A CBS 6 News viewer and the Better Business Bureau are sounding the alarm about a sophisticated phone scam targeting people in Central Virginia. The Better Business Bureau, Tom Gallinger, said the scam started when a caller pretended to be an Internal Revenue Service IRS agent, aka extortionist, tells the person he or she owes money that must be paid immediately. All right, sounds legit so far. The caller then presses the victim to wire money from either a Walmart, CVS, or Walgreens. If the victim does not comply, the criminal threatens to have the victim arrested. Sounds like the IRS so far. Tom Bishop, who lives in Palatin, told CBX 6 News someone posing as an IRS agent called his home Thursday morning. Bishop said the caller pressured and then threatened him to wire money. Gallinger said that the government agency simply doesn't work that way. It doesn't? Uh, please uh, elaborate. Please enlighten me. How does the IRS work? It says here, quote, If the IRS needs to get money from you, they will contact you. Remember, just don't believe that someone can force you to give them that money. They can't. Gallinger explained, you have rights and you don't have to give anybody anything you don't want to give them. I wish that was fucking true. <laughs> I wish you had the freedom to uh, say, no, I do not want you to steal my money. Uh, I don't care what three letter acronym name of an agency you go by, but yeah, this is my property, right? Um, this is where rights are derived from. And of course, everything that the government is goes against that. 
Um, so it's kind of funny that the, um, so there's an interesting competition between uh, these thieves. You know, you have the stolen scam, someone pretending to be an IRS extortion agent, and you have the IRS extortion agent saying, um, pretty much they're stealing, well, I wouldn't say that they're stealing business from them, uh, because of course, regardless if you give up that money to the uh, scam artist, uh, you're still gonna have to give it up to the IRS, right? You have no freedom of economic choice. Remember that. So it's kind of funny that this person here feels, of course, to tell you that you have rights, that you shouldn't be able, you should not give up something that's yours, your property to other people. Well, great, universalize that notion and apply it to the IRS. White guy wins, <laughs> this is a funny one. White guy wins after leading voters to believe he's black. This happened in Houston. Dave Wilson chuckles as he talks about his unorthodox political campaign. Quote, I'd always said it was a long shot. Wilson says, no, I did not expect to win. Still, he figured he'd have fun running because he was fed up with what he called all the shenanigans at the Houston Community College system. As a conservative white Republican running in a district where, whose voters are overwhelmingly black Democrats, the odds seemed overwhelmingly against him. Then he came up with an idea an advertising strategy that his opponent found disgusting. If a white guy didn't have a chance in a mostly African-American district, Wilson will lead voters to think he's black. So I guess this is an interesting litmus test to see if perhaps voting is uh, bigoted in any way. If, of course, the issues and the merits of the politician are more important than the color of his skin. So let's find out. Let's see what happens. And, of course, it says... Uh, <laughs> It worked. Uh, it worked. And one of the biggest political upsets in Houston politics this election season, Wilson emerged as a surprise winner over a 24-year incumbent. This guy who's been in there for 24 years defeated by this guy who pretended to be black. And this is how he did it. So Wilson, a gleeful political troublemaker, uh, printed direct mail pieces strongly implying that he's black. His flyers were decorated with photographs of smiling African-American faces, which he readily admits he just lifted off of websites. And so these are the flyers that he mailed around his community. This pictures of a lot of different um, African-American families posted on there. And of course, implying that, that this candidate that his name associated is also black. Um, so this should be revealing in the fact that when people vote, they're not voting in what's the best interest of the country. They're not voting in what's the best interest of their community. They're not voting in what's the best interest for how best to move forward as a civilization. Uh, the moving board for what's best for them <laughs> it has nothing to do with you, has nothing to do with uh, benevolency, it's uh, for selfish reasons, right? It's uh, again, it's other ways that they trick us into having this political warfare and creating a lot of these racial divide, a lot of these um, bigoted ways that we uh, hold each other back, right? And of course, here's a perfect example on how bigoted these uh, voting systems are. Um, they're not really, people who do go in there are not voting for the manners or the issues at hand. Um, they're voting for whether or not the person is male or female, whether they're black or white, um, whether in regards to age or a lot of other superficial reasons. Um, and that's what you have with politics. That's what you have with government. So again, a lot of uh, prejudice bullshit. Homeless mother who sent six-year-old son to a better school in the wrong town, jailed for five years. A mother who pleaded guilty to fraudulently enrolling her six-year-old son in the wrong school district has been sentenced to five years in prison. Tonya McDowell sent her son to an elementary school in Norwalk, Connecticut, instead of her home city of Bridgeport. The 34-year-old who was homeless when she was charged with felony larceny last year said she wanted the best educational possible for the boy. Authorities told the hearing that she used a babysitter's address to enroll her son in kindergarten in Norwalk when she should have attended schools in Bridgeport, her last permanent address. McDonald told police who was living in a van and occasionally slept at a Norwalk shelter in a friend's Bridgeport apartment when she enrolled her son in Norwalk's Brookside Elementary School. And then police said she, <laughs> this is the most ridiculous part, but before I, I talk about what the police are accusing her of stealing and the amount of education, um, this is a uh, particular interesting matter that happens a lot more frequently than you think. 
uh, especially in Northern Virginia, um, I have a lot of family that uh, we've gone through the same measures to provide them uh, better public school access. And by using friends' houses, by using um, being in a particular zip code, uh, differentiates, you know, uh, an area of state indoctrination system, of course, that offers French classes and interesting courses that are higher developmental uh, areas to that uh, contrast and sharp contrast to what could be provided like at Falsters High School or um, different areas that uh, don't have the tax funding, you know, the amount of wealth distribution to fund those extortion practices of um, mandating children to go to school. And so it's interesting that um, even within the matrix, we think there's different areas in the matrix that can help provide a better opportunities for, for children. Uh, instead of realizing that all public schools are not uh, are unhealthy for children. Um, all public schools are nothing but a cage, a prison for your child's mind, um, for robbing them of their creativity, robbing them of their interest, um, and for many of times drugging them uh, because they because of course a doctor will say, you know, perhaps uh, your child is the one with the problem. And so maybe perhaps looking at the environment is the problem for the child. And of course, and so much in the matter of the way that they herd a lot of children around through these school systems, uh, like cattle, right? Uh, pushing them from subject to job subject that perhaps a child doesn't have an interest in. And of course, most of the subjects like history and your social sciences are nothing but more than political propaganda, you know, uh, different ways to indoctrinate your child into a self-servant, obedient slave. You know, it's another tax cattle for the state to kind of nurture and grow and to become um, another human being they can leech off of and become a parasitic um, attachment to your child when they grow up to help fund a lot of these unfunded liabilities that's government. That's all they see your children as, just future tax cattle. So please say McDonald's stole $15,686 worth of free educational services from Norwalk. Again, it's not free. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, they're already stealing from her, right? Uh, through sales taxes, you know, she has a job. Uh, it's, I guess she's trying to find a better, I could see that, a better prison for a child. You know, I guess there's a difference from, I guess, federal prison and state prison and your local county jail and she's trying to find a better jail system for her child to attend. You know, we're already in a cage to begin with, so I can see why people, um, and again, I've had a lot of personal experience in, um, with a lot of uh, people I do know that went through the same process to give their child a better education system that's found than what's found in their local public indoctrination school. Uh, but it's ridiculous that the police are gonna tell her that she stole that amount of money. When, of course, the police themselves are funded through theft. <laughs> the police themselves are funded through that extortion from stealing from you and putting that into their pockets. So it's interesting that, uh, of course, it's stealing when you do it. Uh, but again, it's taxes when the government does it. And uh, yeah, so, so of course, you also plead four counts of selling narcotics. Um, you know, just another victim's crime, just trying to, again, she's living out of her van. Uh, it's not, that's the product of the education system that provided her, right? Um, of course, she went through a public indoctrination system, of course, herself. And when she got out, you know, they don't really give you any uh, really good skills to market yourself out there. You know, it's um, the statism that failed her, you know, government that failed her. Blockbuster didn't have to die. This video rental company proves it. Blockbuster may be dead, but people are still going out and running movies, at least according to the president of the country's largest movie rental chain, Family Video. When video rental giant Blockbuster announced this week that it would shutter its remaining 300 U.S. stores, headlines were quick to explain that Netflix and other online video outlets killed the business. The number of video rental storefronts in the U.S. had dropped dramatically to 6,122 in 2012, from 28,000 in 1999. That's less than uh, five years. But family video seems to show that in some areas of the country, there are still a lot of people who just want to go out and spend a few dollars to rent a movie. And in fact, many physical stores have already been replaced by those uh, kiosks at uh, Redbox. Quote, we know there is still a place in the market for physical media because folks like Redbox and family video are still doing well. Said Diane Rayburn, executive vice president of streaming media.com. 
Blockbuster's demise was accelerated by poor management and a scattered strategy, Ray Burke said. The video giant attempted several awkward leaps in the world of digital video, but never succeeded. In the end, Blockbuster ended up isolating a lot of customers and destroying their once vibrant brand in the process. Family Video, on the other hand, is pretty committed to its brick and mortar strategy. Customers pay less than $3 for a movie rental. Nice. Late fees are negotiable. Even better. And children's movies rent for free. <laughs> uh, you can't beat that. Uh, a key draw for well families. And so, again, you'll find that in a free market, people find creative ways to compete. Um, and at the end, it's just uh, how you market your business. You know, Blockbuster had a great head start. Had a, they had, they were at the top of the game for, for quite a long time. Uh, you, you had VD Warehouse, if anyone around Virginia remembers that. I used to work at one. Uh, but at the same time, that's kind of what happened with Yahoo when Google came out. That's what happened with MySpace when Facebook came out. Uh, you find different ways to find an improvement of that product and service to you, the consumer, right? And of course, the only way to continue to keep that business rotating is to provide you a better experience. And of course, this is uh, something that Blockbuster couldn't keep up. Uh, they couldn't uh, adapt as quickly and uh, as fluid as they wanted to. But at the same time, you'll find that regardless of that case for that particular business, that there's still other people who can still find a good uh, strategy, a good way, a business uh, plan to still market the same kind of product, but in a different way to kind of reach other areas around the country. And this guy's got a really cool way of doing that, um, especially providing movies for children for free, right? Especially the negotiation aspect of uh, late fees which is uh, pretty cool. <laughs> kind of, I guess, matching uh, Netflix is a way of um, that there's no uh, late fees. And uh, you'll find, because I remember before in, with Blockbuster, they're very ardent, they're very strict. Uh, I recall in the past of um, your video being late, even if it was 30 minutes late, even you dropped it in and it was like, you know, sorry, there's, I don't know if they had a little timer, but you know, didn't meet the cutoff time and you'd have to pay the uh, late fee. And so it's fun that if you can negotiate with that, you know, you find that only in private businesses or in a free market, you can negotiate late fees and kind of take that off. You know, of course, if you had a, if you ever call your AT&T service provider and you've always been on time providing the, the payments and then there's maybe perhaps this one time that it didn't come in through on time and I've negotiated my way into waiving that, you know, banks will do that too, you know, but of course governments don't <laughs> try, um, not paying your, your taxes, right? They'll just double in the next month, uh, try negotiating to have it cut. It's like, sorry, good luck. Unless, of course, you have Mark Stevens on your side. Um, but for the most part, it just continues to go up. You can't negotiate with uh, government. Again, they're nothing but uh, thieves. They're nothing but the mafia. They're nothing but criminals. And like criminals, they're never really open for a negotiation, and especially when they have the gun pointed at you, right? Um, and you don't have much of a choice in that regards. And as so much in a free market, you do have choices, voluntary consensual choices. And that's what uh, the non-aggressive principle is all about. Whereas government decivilizes us into the opposite direction, of course. And, and again, um, in free markets, nothing but consensual choices. In a state controlled market, you have no economic freedom. So with that, Thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying the 17th episode of Resistance. You guys take good care, and I'll see you guys at the victory party.